Okay, this is block seven, the greatest generation, section one, FDR's foreign policy, with the section beginning Cordell Hall. Cordell Hall was Roosevelt's Secretary of State from 1933 all the way until 1944, uh, when he was tasked with President Roosevelt of kind of founding the United Nations. Uh, there's three acts, there's three things that we're going to go through that was kind of um, the responsibility of Secretary Hall. Uh, the first is the Tidings McDuffie Act. Uh, the Tidings McDuffie Act of 1934 provided for the independence of the Philippines by 1946. That after the United States has annexed the Philippines all the way back in 1898, we've um, been promising them their independence. They had a degree of self government. We saw uh, under President Wilson, uh, President Wilson gave the Filipinos a, de a large degree of self government. And then finally in 1934, this Tidings McDuffie, uh, McDuffie Act uh, provided that in 1946 the Philippines would be full and completely independent states. The United States, it said, according to this agreement, would give up the rights to base uh, soldiers there, that army bases would be given up, but that naval bases would be open to further negotiation and discussion. And as it were, uh, after the war, the United States still retained naval bases uh, in the Philippines. On the surface, this is a good thing. We've been promising the Filipinos their independence for two generations by 1934. Uh, but Japan looks at this and Japan's interpretation of this event is that the United States is no longer interested uh, in maintaining a presence in Asia. And if, that, if Japan were to put pressure on the United States, the United States is not sold on staying as a power uh, in Asia. And Japan follows this very closely. The next thing that Roosevelt's administration, led by Secretary Hull, did was formally recognize the Soviet Union. Now, we talked about recognition a little while ago. Recognition means that one country formally recognizes the government of another and engages in normal diplomatic uh, relations with that country. Well, after the Russian Revolution, because the Russia's new rulers are communists, uh, because they have murdered their way to power, uh, because they stand for international revolution, the United States never recognized the Soviet government. Uh, and never had formal relations with the Soviet government. 1933, Roosevelt ends this. Um, he ends it for two basic reasons. Uh, one is Roosevelt wants to pull the Soviet Union uh, back into international affairs uh, in order to provide a check against the rising power of Germany. Uh, so it's a little bit of realpolitik in a sense that Roosevelt needs uh, as many countries lined up against Germany and Italy as possible. And this is one way to kind of start bringing the Soviet Union back into the international community uh, from which it had been expelled after the Russian Revolution. And most countries did not have diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. Uh, and Roosevelt moved to have those relations uh, between the United States and the Soviets. His other reason was because his cabinet was filled with left-wing progressives. Uh, who had a soft spot in their hearts for uh, the communist experiment of, so of the Soviet Union. And it was kind of an emotional uh, thing that, of course, we need to recognize the great experiment uh, in human equality and human decency and human dignity uh, that was going on in the Soviet Union. So those two reasons, there was kind of an emotional reason, very important with a lot of Roosevelt's allies uh, in his cabinet, in Congress, and it was important in uh, Roosevelt's eyes in a foreign affairs sense. So for the first time in 1933, uh, uh, there is an American ambassador to the Soviet capital of Moscow, and there is a Soviet ambassador in Washington, D.C. Relations are frosty at best, uh, but the relations are, after 1933, in place. Hull's last uh, thing that we're going to talk about today was the Act of Havana. Uh, in 1930, I think it's seven, in 1937, uh, the Pan-American Union, which is an organization of all of those Latin American republics and the United States kind of working together, uh, they, they enacted the Act of Havana. And that, um, that act declared that any Latin American nation was permitted in the name of self-defense uh, to take over European territories in Latin America. This is the opposite of the Monroe Doctrine this is the opposite of Roosevelt's corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Here, what you have is 
Latin American countries giving themselves the right to take over European colonies in order to defend themselves. And the thinking goes that if there's a Dutch colony in the Caribbean that gets conquered and Holland gets conquered by the Germans, this Dutch colony could be a springboard for German troops in the Western Hemisphere. Um, so in the name of self-defense, these European colonies uh, could be taken over by the Latin American republics uh, and the United States. Now, this had no binding force. This is not as, you know, the, the European colonial powers obviously were not a, a fan of this. But it does, it, it shows the changing relationship that the imperial powers of Europe are growing weaker and the United States and the Americas are growing stronger. Um, it's not going to play much of a role in World War II. It's more a sense of uh, who did the future belong to? Did the future belong to the people of Latin America or to the, co the colonies of the imperial powers? Uh, the future did not belong to the colonies of the imperial powers.